Welcome to The Weaver Sews. I'm Daryl Lancaster. We covered how to make and apply piping in a seam and specifically in the band seam for this handwoven jacket in a previous video. I left the right front unsewn in anticipation of creating interrupted piping which will become loops for buttons. This is an easy way to get a closure without cutting into the fabric or adding any additional elements. This technique works well for any pattern with a separate band or placket down the center front. The trickiest part of this is figuring out how long to make the loops and that will require some testing. First though, I'd like to talk about how to get a more custom looking button than what you've got laying around. I purchase buttons when I'm in a place that has interesting buttons. I go to knitting shops. They usually have the most interesting ones, though I have found some odd treasures at big box retailers. How many buttons to buy? Kind of depends on the size of the button. I usually purchase an odd number, and I can't say why exactly, but Fibonacci math comes to mind, and there is a symmetry to an odd amount of anything. If the button is very large, I'll purchase just one. If the button is around an inch and a quarter, maybe three centimeters, I'll usually get three. If the button is smaller than three quarters of an inch or two centimeters, uh, I might purchase five buttons. This means that I have a couple of boxes of terrific buttons to search through when I'm sewing something, knowing how difficult it is anymore to go find buttons to match a current project. Sometimes when I just don't have anything really exciting, I'll stack what I have to make something interesting. I did that here in this spectator coat from Folkwear Patterns, made using a piecing technique with one of my leftover handwoven fabrics. The buttons here started with a couple of basic boring abalone shell discs, followed with a couple of buttons that don't even match in color, but in this context, they work. Small beads cover the holes, so they look even more custom and elegant. For this jacket, I've taken some really plain navy blue plastic buttons, the right color and size, but really boring. And I've added a square button cut from some kind of nut uh, shaped so that it will lay flat on top of the round button. And I found a couple of beads that help pick up the other colors in this very bold striped hand woven fabric. I've gone ahead and sewn one of the combo buttons in place so that you can see the results. Sewing these buttons on is a little challenging since you have to get all the holes to line up and we will need to leave a thread shank to accommodate the button loop. I'll demonstrate how to sew these buttons on and leave a thread shank at the end of this tutorial. Here's a jacket that I've made with a lovely metal button with a metal shank. And for the closure, I've taken the cording and I've interrupted it to form the loops. You'll notice that the cording loops originate on the right side of the garment, which is typical of a woman's garment. Buttonholes and closures are always on the right. For more gender neutral and men's garments, put the buttonholes or closures on the left. There isn't time or space in this video to discuss all of the theories why this is so. And really, put the closures wherever it makes you happy. The buttons are attached or sewn to the center front of the left band in the case of this jacket. So the loops would be located on the right front. The goal is to pull the two bands together so they overlap. I've used this cool expanding sewing gauge 
to help space the buttons visually, knowing that I want the first button and loop to connect right under the bust. The loop we will create when we interrupt the piping should be long enough to go over the button and yet short enough to keep the two bands overlapping without them moving around. I can't stress enough how important it is to test this technique first. My original test was creating the loop from piping, which I interrupted and then decided instead to go with cording, which I've used now on the rest of the band. Remember that cording is piping with a stuffing or a filler. And in this case, I've used a cotton eighth inch or three millimeter drapery cording. Start with cording that has been basted together. Since we will need to carefully remove some of the basting to create the loops, and I covered making cording in a previous video. On the right band, which will get the closure in this case, carefully note the position of the buttons from the left front and create a placement marking indicating with a tailor's tack or a running basting line the position of the where the loop will fall. Measure the diameter of the button and create a start and stop mark with pins for each loop centered on the placement marking. My plan is to have three loops and three buttons on this jacket. I've completed the top one so that you can see the finished result and what we're aiming for. The button sewn onto the left front sits on the center front line which is 7 eighths of an inch, or 2.2 centimeters, from the folded edge of the band. So the loop coming out of that seam will have to reach 7 eighths and return, and there will need to be some ease. The cording in this case is a bit bulky, so more ease is needed than, say, the loop on this jacket. And the button will need to be sewn on, leaving a longer than average thread shank to accommodate the thickness of the loop. For the loop length of this particular cording, I've measured 7 eighths of an inch times 2, which is 1 and 3 quarters of an inch, or 4.5 centimeters. To that, I've added a half an inch of ease for a total loop of two and a quarter inches or 5.7 centimeters. The easiest way to do this, because the cording is still in cording form, is to pin the cording to the start line, clip away the basting for two and a quarter inches, and then pin where the basting resumes to the stop line to create the button loop length. Once the cording is pinned into place on the garment section, in this case the band, clip the seam allowances of the cording to but not through the basting line at the start and stop lines. This frees up the seam allowances so that they can be manually turned into a tube. Trim the seam allowances in the area of the loop down to about a quarter of an inch or six millimeter. This amount can be more or less depending on how much bulk you want in the loop. Now, since the seam allowances will turn in and stuff the loop, 
any stuffing or fill in the loop will have to be removed to make room for the seam allowances. Carefully reach into the cording with the tip of sharp scissors and clip out the filler or stuffing from inside the loop area where the basting was removed. With a sharp pointy thing like a stiletto, long needle, or a quill, which is my favorite, push the seam allowances firmly into the cording to create a tight tube. Close up the tube with hand sewing. You want a nice, firm, round loop that will go over the button. It might be helpful to actually test the loop before doing the final stitching of the cording to the band and then attaching the band to the garment. Once you have signed off, so to speak, on all of the loops, permanently stitch the cording onto the band, backstitching at the beginning and end of the loop areas. This will be a high stress point and you'll need it to be secure. Once the cording's attached to the band, the band can be attached to the garment. We covered this in a previous video. Watch that video to see how to finish off the cording at the lower edge. Be sure to keep the loops out of the way when stitching the band to the garment as they're sandwiched between the band and the jacket front and not visible. This technique also works well when piping or cording the outer perimeter of a garment. I did this when piping the exterior edge of this vest using bias cut upholstery velvet, interrupting the piping for the button closure. And don't feel limited here. I used the same technique with a kumahimo braid that I created, which I hand couched in the band seam ditch and interrupted to create the button loops. With a little planning and a bit of testing, you'll get some pretty wow results. And finally, how to sew on a proper button with a thread shank. Many buttons have a metal or plastic shank attached, which makes life easy when you need to leave space between the button and the wall of the garment. Because I stacked my buttons and the button does not have a any kind of a shank on the back, plastic or otherwise, I'll need to line up the holes and create a thread shank instead of a metal or plastic one. I use regular polyester sewing thread. I don't have a good supply of button thread, so I make use of what I have. You want a really long length of thread, fold it in half. This requires really good eyes or good close-up glasses, but you're going to thread the needle with both ends at the same time. Once through, pull the tails to meet the fold and knot them together. You'll have four strands of sewing thread for each pass of the needle. Take all four strands and pass them as one through a cake of beeswax. Now we've covered the details of hand sewing in a previous video. I'm going to hide the knot on the underside and take a small stitch to secure. Carefully bring the needle up towards the front of the band and then through the stacked buttons and through the small bead you'll want to return through the same hole, anchoring the bead in place. Now we'll have to create some sort of spacer. This can be a small stick, eighth of an inch or three millimeter dowel, a match stick, a double pointed knitting needle, anything that will keep space beneath the button. 
Repeat the previous step. Bring the needle back to the front surface of the band, through all layers, up through the two buttons, around the bead, and back down to the back of the band. Move over to the other hole in the button. Carefully find the path up through the second hole, around the bead, and back down through all layers, maintaining the spacing with the small stick. Repeat this step again for the second hole. Bring the needle back up to the top surface of the band and out between the band and the button. Remove the stick or spacer. Wrap the threaded needle firmly a few times around the group of threads between the button and the surface of the garment, creating a thread shank. Pass the needle back through the band to the underside. Knot off the needle by creating a loop. And then a second loop. And pull securely. Bury the knot by passing the needle into the band and coming out about a half inch or 1.2 centimeters away and cut the thread. And then repeat for all the remaining buttons. Yes, this interrupted piping technique takes a bit of practice and uh, some good old fashioned planning ahead. But the end result is a super way to use piping or cording as a closure. One that will create a double take when someone is inspecting your garment up close, like the guild member sitting next to you at a guild meeting. I love when people exclaim, how did you do that? I'm Daryl Lancaster for The Weaver Sews.